we have these people in our lives. And these people show up and they say something in a certain way and it doesn't make any difference if somebody else said it, we would just ignore it. All right? But they come along and they say this thing and boom, off you go. And you're frantic and you're mad and you're angry, you're upset, you're worked up, you're feeling unworthy. So these people to me are your soulmates, you see. Because what they're teaching you at any given moment in your life is you haven't mastered yourself at this moment. You're not in charge of yourself. Those people who can push your buttons and send you into a frenzy or into an angry space or into a space of self-repudiation are people who are divine masters disguised as manipulative, crass, unconcerned people. <laughs> and rather than being mad at them and being upset with them and saying that they shouldn't be this way, your task ought to be to turn to them and bow and say, I honor you as my teacher. Now, that's a hard thing for us to get to, but don't you all have people in your life who are just like that? And you know you're stuck with them. These are people who are not on your path. You know they're not on your path. They're not even on an entrance ramp to your path. <laughs> they're in a different place. They're from a different planet. But nevertheless, they're there with you. And you're sharing the journey with them. And it's very interesting. I mean, I have eight children. And uh, my children are the ones that are very good at knowing how to push these buttons. I have one daughter particularly, her name is Serena, that can really do this very well. She's real good at it. She's always giving me advice almost every day on, on how to be a better parent. She even said to me one time, she said, I can't believe you actually wrote a book uh, on how to be a better parent. I just can't believe that. This is about, she was about nine years old telling me this. You really wrote that? And... Uh, Whenever she gives me this advice, it's like, or she starts going into one of her routines, I find myself, you know, really being challenged, you know. I don't usually turn around and say, I honor you for, you know, I'm usually saying, well, you. <laughs> but nevertheless, there's a part of me that recognizes this, and I also recognize it in uh, my relationship with my wife. And we've been together for a long time, and there are areas where she will say something, and I will find myself, and then I'll stop. You see, because essentially, the ego part of us wants us to be right. Whereas the higher part of us always wants what? Peace. That's all it ever wants. So it's like you have to really learn, if you're going to feel worthy of having something show up in your life, how to be peaceful. And the way to be peaceful in your life is to, in all of your relationships, when you have a choice to be right or to be kind, to just pick kind to just choose to be kind at any given moment in your life. You are honoring that higher part of you, you feel peaceful, and you've let go of the ego need, which says, wait a minute, you're important. And you have to prove that this other person shouldn't have done that, and all of that kind of stuff. But Serena, I remember her, her telling me, she's great, she would tell me, uh, uh, giving me advice on how to be a parent. One day I just had had it with her. And I said, you know, Serena, I said, it's time for you to stop telling me what kind of a parent to be and stop blaming me for the kind of parent I am and take responsibility yourself for the kind of parent that I am. <laughs> and she stopped and she assumed this pose that she always assumes with her hand on her hip you know, and her knee going up and down real fast and she said, you want to run that one by me one more time? <laughs> you want me, is that what I heard? You want me to be responsible for the kind of parent you are? I said, exactly. She said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, before you came here, you had a choice. You have certain heroic missions that you have to fulfill while you're here on this planet. And I'm giving her this little lecture. You know? She said, well, what do you mean before I came here? She said, I don't remember that. I said, well, your memory isn't anything that you should rely upon to determine whether this works or doesn't work. You don't remember being four months old and being in your crib and throwing up all over, but you did. You don't remember your dreams last night. You don't remember what you had for dinner last Thursday. Your memory isn't a good indicator of what it was. Just trust me, this is true. Before you come here, you choose your parents. You get to pick who your parents are. 
and you have certain lessons that you have to learn, and you picked me to be your father, and you picked mom to be your mother, and you should stop complaining about the choice that you made. She said, I don't remember any of this. I said, well, forget about whether you remember it or not. She said, you're telling me that I chose you to be my father before I came here, and I had lessons to learn through you. I said, exactly. And you should stop blaming me. You should just take responsibility for the choice you made. She said, I must have been in a big hurry. <laughs> so, these are your tests, all right? So what I would like you to think about when you think about honoring your worthiness to receive anything is that all of the people in your life that you find yourself in conflict with or having a difficult time with, whether they're strangers or spouses or children or grandparents or in-laws or even people who are no longer here on this earth plane. If you can say to yourself, when I have this choice at any given moment to be right or to be kind and I'm going to let my ego get out of this thing and I'm going to choose to be at peace, as it says in The Course in Miracles, I can choose peace rather than this at any given moment. And then when you find yourself in these relationships with contentious people and you find yourself being able to be at peace when they push those buttons, you'll know that the reason that they showed up in your life in the first place is to teach you to honor your own worthiness. That's why you're with them. That's what they're there for. These are teachers, just like you are teachers to others. And you can let go of that ego-driven need to constantly be proving yourself and to make yourself right and to make more than making yourself right, to make them wrong, which is what we often do in this whole business of uh, not honoring that. Whenever you're about to act, to do anything, if you have any conflict at all, you can ask yourself the question, is what I'm about to say, is what I'm about to do going to bring me peace, more peace in my life, or is it going to bring a sense of turmoil? Is there going to be some struggle, some anxiety as a result of what I'm going to say or what I'm going to do? If the answer is peace, then it's your highest self. If the answer is turmoil, struggle, anxiety, stress, then the answer is your ego. So now you've identified, and now you know how to act. The way to act is with the way that will bring you peace. Even if it seems inconsistent, the way to act is the way that will bring you peace. The second thing to do is to start to learn to go beyond this restriction that you've experienced in the physical plane. The restrictions of the physical plane are many. Begin to say, I can transcend that, and your mind begin to look at yourself as living in that physical plane, but that's not who you are. So figure out ways in your own consciousness to just get past all of these limitations that are a part of your body and your world. The third is wherever you go, Refuse to defend yourself to anyone or to anything on the earth plane. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to prove yourself. You can just quietly be an effective human being and not get yourself into that position where you're arguing with someone over the rightness of how you feel. Just let go of that. And the higher part of you is saying, I want peace. I want peace. It's always there. Keep that in mind. And finally, learn to surrender and to trust in that wisdom that created you. The act of surrendering is letting go, detaching yourself from all of the beliefs that you have that it's important for you to be right and it's important for you to prove other people wrong and all of these kinds of things that keep you sort of in that restriction. Once you surrender and once you let go, you find yourself a whole lot freer in your life. To understand that you have a higher self and to know it and be aware of it is one thing, but to trust in it is quite something else. And the ways to put this principle into practice are first of all to keep in mind that you cannot go to a higher ground if you're hanging on to a lower level that in order to get yourself to a higher place a place of trust you have to somehow recognize that all of the stuff that's going on in your life in a lower place is something you have to let go of you have to trust that when you do let go you're not going to be falling into the abyss and I would recommend that you take a real rebellious attitude toward the philosophy which preaches that, uh, uh, that you are not connected to the divine energy, that somehow this force that has many names is something that is outside of you, and you're not deserving of it.
until you know that you can trust in it, you can't use it and acknowledge it in your life. One of the things to do to practice this trust is to take the most serious problem that you have and turn it over to God. Affirm to yourself, I would like to show my trust in the divine force by simply turning my problems over to your divine hands. I can remember doing this with some of the things that I really struggled with at one time in my life. Things that I just thought I couldn't get past. I remember going through relationship difficulties. I remember going through problems with uh, drinking and things like this where it just, it just seemed like uh, I wanted to get past it and I just didn't know quite what to do. I can remember times when I would be stuck in my writing and not sure whether I could and I would just stop and I would just say, all right, I'm going to turn this over. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust. I'm going to surrender. And this concept of surrender is very, very important. So when you do this, it's just that simple act of getting down on your knees and staying there on your knees and just say, okay, I'm going to turn this over to something that is higher within myself. And the ego seems to go away and the solution seems to be there for you. The presence of complete trust is evident in your life when you start to think and feel and do are all balanced and they're all in harmony. This is called congruence. If you're congruent, your thoughts and your feelings and your behavior are all in harmony. If you're incongruent, you have one thought about, gee, I'd like to be able to do this, but then you feel another way about it and then you act in a completely different way. And this is the cause of most of the struggles in our life. And it's also the thing that impedes the free flow of the divine force into your life. You have to trust in yourself. When you're trusting in yourself, you're trusting in this very wisdom that is the source of your life. And when you are congruent within and are feeling congruent, you are also beginning to act congruent. So work on congruency and look at the areas in your life in which you feel yourself to be incongruent. What do I think about this and how do I feel and how do I act and try to bring them into harmony? And you'll start accessing this trust, this trust that is absolutely essential to the manifesting process. And of course, as always, you have to begin a meditation practice of contemplating the supreme principle which is beyond the pettiness of this world. And as you meditate and go within and you make conscious contact with God, God isn't something that you know about any longer. God is something that you know directly and personally. And once you have this direct conscious contact, this knowing, then trust is not anything that you'll ever have to work on again. How you process and, and perceive yourself is determined not by what other people tell you as much as you'd like to believe that but in fact by how you have chosen to process yourself and what you want to learn how to do right off the bat at the very beginning is to understand that disliking yourself or experiencing self-rejection or putting yourself down or finding fault with yourself or looking at your body and telling yourself all the things about it that you don't like like you may be too tall you might tell yourself that you're too short you might tell yourself that you're too heavy that you're too light that you're any number of things and you can go through every organ in your body and some people do this very thing and find all kinds of reasons why they don't like this they don't like that they don't like the size of their their legs they don't like the size of their breasts they don't like the way their hair is they don't like their eyes they don't like their ears their nose is too big they're, it's an endless and this is like uh, a burden that you place on yourself in your life and it's something that you want to really begin to process in a different way and a way to process it is to say uh, what do I get out of this what's the what's the point in me disliking myself or finding fault with myself it's the only self I have instead of doing that and uh, keeping myself miserable what I'm going to do is uh, look in the mirror and say to myself, this is the body that I have shown up in for whatever reason, whether it was my plan, or whether it was God's plan, whether it was my parents' plan, whether it was a conspiracy, whatever, it is still the reality. And I am going to accept the reality of what I have shown up in and see it as my curriculum to a higher place. The body that you're in, whether it's in a wheelchair, whether it's blind, whether it's deaf, whether it's tall, whether it's short or black, white, whatever it may be, it is still your curriculum. It's what you have to use to get to the highest place that you want to be in your life. So rejecting it is really rejecting your entire life curriculum. Uh, and you have to really look at the, the whole idea of, in our culture, it's almost, 
I think I have been asked the question on talk shows across America more about this particular subject than anything else. And the question is, isn't it selfish? Aren't you promoting selfishness? Aren't you telling people that uh, they should love themselves and reject all other people and so on? And I'd like to put that to rest right here. The first thing you have to ask yourself is, what does it mean to be selfish? To be selfish is to be a burden to another human being. Whenever you find yourself a burden to somebody else or someone else is a burden to you, that is a very selfish act. The person who dislikes himself, believe it or not, is the biggest burden to be around in the world. This is someone who is never happy, doesn't know how to make themselves happy, is using other people to uh, try to get them to be happy, is always blaming other people for uh, the, the, the conditions of their life. Uh, the person who has self-doubt or self-rejection uh, is uh, doesn't know how to enjoy their life. And being around a person who doesn't enjoy their life is burdensome. The person who does love themselves, who feels good about themselves, who, if you ask the question, do you love yourself, there's not even an issue there. There's not even a question involved. It's simply, of course I do. This is, this is me. This is all I have. Of course I love myself. Why wouldn't I? Why would I ever put myself down? It has nothing to do with uh, being conceited or finding fault with other people, or uh, uh, making yourself better than anybody else. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the simple notion that in order for me to be happy, I have to love myself. In order to be able to uh, be free from being a burden to somebody else, I have to know how to enjoy my life. If I know how to enjoy my life, it means that I am loving the life that I'm having, and that means I'm loving the body that I'm in, I'm loving the self that I am. And therefore, you will not be a burden to anybody else. The person who loves themselves is never a burden to anyone else unless it's conceit. And conceit is just another form of trying to get other people to pay more attention to you. But if it's just authentic self-acceptance, then it is, it is the most important thing that you can do. And in raising children, nothing is more important in the whole educational environment than self-concept, self-esteem. This is what we're trying to teach all the time to young people, is feel good about yourself. Treat yourself, cherish yourself as a, as a valuable, important, significant, grand, divine creature, <laughs> as someone who is unique and special in all the world. And feel that way about yourself wherever you go and carry yourself that way. So you have to say to yourself, they didn't do it to me. I allowed it to happen. And I am no longer willing to allow myself to be immobilized by the rejection that other people or other events or other institutions or whatever it may be may have uh, attempted to impose on me. So what you want to do at this point is, is if, you, if you can see that that, that there are areas of your life in which you are self-rejecting and identify them and make a commitment to changing them, then you can come up with some specific things that you can do about it. You can begin to, to discipline yourself to select new responses to others' attempts uh, at, at, making you feel, um, at making you feel good. When someone says to you, uh, gee, you look really nice today, you can practice instead of that immediate self-rejecting kind of oh, it really isn't me, or this is my hairdresser, or whatever, you can, you can just, a, a very simple thank you, or it's nice to know that, uh, that you appreciate me. Just, even if you don't mean it, I mean, just, sometimes you have to fake it, but faking it is all right, as long as you are practicing a kind of, hey, I'm, you yeah, know, if someone says to me I look nice, or that I smell good, or that I look nice in this outfit, or that I look younger than I am, or whatever, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm entitled to that. I'm entitled to a compliment. I'm worth that. You can practice saying things like, I love you, and, and check out when someone says that back to you. How do you react to that? What is, the, what is your reaction to that? And accept the I love you's and the caresses and the, and the affection that other people are directing at you as, a, as something that is directed towards someone who deserves that rather than always doubting it and saying, oh, I wonder if he really does that, or I wonder if she really means it, or if, and, and all of the doubting kind of things. I, I, of course you would love me. Your, your attitude, your inner conversation goes, of course you would love me. I'm, I'm worth being loved. I'm a, valuable, I'm a valuable person. And as we move up from 10,000 cycles per second on your emotional health, we move through the various symptoms of neurosis, worry, Fear, anxiety, stress, tension, self-rejection. 
until we get to a point at point B where we are experiencing an absence of symptoms. However, we know that at any moment, one phone call or one piece of news that is not consistent with what I expect, I could, it's called dissonance, this cognitive or emotional or affective dissonance could literally create in me a state of immobility. So the right phone call or the right action or somebody having an accident or somebody not doing what I think they should or somebody even saying something to me that I dislike or whatever it might be and I could instantly go back into 18, 16, 14 and perhaps even 12 and 11 and 10,000 cycles per second. It's been discussed that chronic depression is uh, something that affects as much, I've heard estimates, as high as 20% of the population. That people are consuming things like Prozac and antidepressives at an alarming rate. And it's intriguing because there's no such thing as depression. I defy anyone to go out with a container and bring back any depression. The world is just the way it is. And there's no depression in it. There are only people thinking depressing thoughts. And then those depressing thoughts affecting our chemistry, our physical makeup, to a point where we become immobilized. There's no stress in our world. The world is the way it is. There are only people thinking stressful thoughts. And those stressful thoughts become our reality, our detachment from our source, our separation from our source. We start moving away from our source rather than toward it. And as we move in the opposite direction of our source, we find ourselves breaking down, being emotionally immobilized, upset, fearful, anxious, and so on. Now as I move to my right, on this uh, scale of con on the scale of emotional health, we reach a point called point C. And at point C, at 100,000 cycles per second, we understand the meaning behind Terry Cole Whitaker's title of her book, "What You Think of Me Is None of My Business." That is. I am living here at a state not in which I am unaffected by emotionally the things that occur in my life and in the life of those I love and I'm around, but that I cannot become immobilized by them. I cannot, I will not allow myself to lose my sense of balance, my sense of connection to God because of what someone out there might do, even if that someone is very, very close to me, the closest person in my life. I am independent of the good opinion of all of those around me. This is 100,000 cycles per second. Illustrative of it is a, um, a story that is told of um, the Buddha, and everywhere he went, he had all of these followers, but he also had people who were critical of him. And these people would find fault with him, and they would... Uh, say things about him that were insulting and they would be very um, uh, inflammatory and uh, they would be extremely critical of him and every time that they would behave in these ways towards the Buddha he would respond with love with kindness that's all he could ever say and one day one of his students said to him I just don't understand for days and days, these people have been so critical and so ugly in their reactions towards you, and always you still react with kindness and love. How do you do that? How does that work? And the Buddha responded with something that I think um, is very, very relevant to our lives. He said, if someone offers you a gift, and you do not accept that gift, to whom does the gift belong? And that was his answer. If someone offers you a gift of their hatred, 
of their criticism, of their bitterness, of their tension, of their fault finding, if they offer this to you, but you don't accept it, to whom does it belong? Why, it's theirs. And the Buddha was saying, why would you ever choose to allow yourself to become depressed, upset, immobilized over something that belongs elsewhere? It's not yours. You don't own it. What you think of me is none of my business. Non-erroneous zone people, which I now call Nez and Easy, are different from the normals in our world. While they look very much like everyone else, if you observe very closely, you'll note distinct qualities, none of which are racial, socioeconomic, or sexual, which disconnects them from so many other people. They do not fit neatly into any role definition, job descriptions, geographic patterns, educational levels, or financial statistics. There's a different quality about them, but the different part is not discernible by scanning the traditional external factors that typify many efforts at classifying people. They may be rich or poor, male or female, black or white, living anywhere, doing just about anything, and yet they are different in that they have no erroneous zones. How can you tell when you run into a Nez person? Watch them. Listen to them. This is what you'll discover. First, and most obviously, you see a person who likes virtually everything about life. Yep, this is a liker. A person who is comfortable doing just about anything. And one who wastes no time in complaining or wishing that things were otherwise. They are enthusiastic about life, and they want all that they can get out of it. They like picnics, and movies, books, sports, concerts, cities, farms, animals, mountains, and just about anything that you can include in your list. They just plain like. When you are around them, you'll note a startling absence of grumbling, moaning, or even passive sighing. If it rains, they like it. If it's hot, they dig it rather than croak about it. If they're in a traffic jam or at a party or all alone, they simply deal with what is there. No pretending to enjoy, but a sensible acceptance of what is and an outlandish ability to delight in virtually everything. Ask them what they don't like, and they are hard-pressed to come up with an honest answer. They don't have sense enough to come in out of the rain. Why? Because they see rain as beautiful, thrilling, and something to experience. They like it. Slush doesn't send them into a fury. They observe it, splash around in it, and accept it as a part of what it means to be alive. Do they like cats? Yes. Bears? Yes. Worms? Yep. You'll be hard-pressed to come up with things, events, people, activities, or ideas that they dislike. They live, and while such annoyances as disease germs, droughts, mosquitoes, floods, and the like are not warmly embraced by Nez people, they never spend any of their present moments complaining about them or wishing that they weren't so. If situations need to be eradicated, then they will very likely work as eradicators, enjoying themselves and living all of their present moments. Try as you might you'll have a tough time coming up with something they'll dislike doing. Truly, they are likers of life, and they wallow in all of it, getting out of it all that is possible for them. A Nez person is free from guilt and all of the attendant anxiety that goes with using up your present moments, being immobilized over past events. Certainly, they can admit to making mistakes, and they can vow to avoid repeating certain behaviors that are counterproductive in any way but they did not waste their time wishing that they hadn't done something or being upset because they disliked something that they had done at an earlier moment in their life. Complete freedom from guilt will be the shocking behavior that you will observe in your Nez person. No lamenting the past and no efforts to make others choose their own guilt by asking such inane questions as, why didn't you do it differently? Or aren't you ashamed of yourself? And so on. They seem to recognize that life lived through is just that and no amount of feeling bad will alter the past. While they practice this non-guilt on themselves without any effort, because it is natural, they are remarkably free from even helping others to choose guilt for themselves, because they see with a third internal eye that feeling bad in the present moment only reinforces a poor self-image, 
and that learning from the past is a far superior tact over remonstrating about the past. You'll never see them manipulating others by telling them how bad they've been, nor will you be able to manipulate them with the same tactics. They won't get angry at you. They'll simply ignore it and see you as someone who is a guilt dispenser. Rather than being upset at you, they'll go away or they'll change the subject. Hence, you won't even recognize that the very strategy that works so beautifully on most people has failed dismally on your Nez friend. Rather than smear themselves and others with guilt, they just unceremoniously pass when it comes along. Similarly, your Nez chap will be a non-worrier. You'll soon note that circumstances that drive many people to frenzy will be mildly internalized by a Nez person. They are not planners and putters away for the future. They refuse to worry when you do, and they keep themselves unmucked up by the accompanying anxiety that goes with worry. You can't drive him or her crazy with worry. They don't know how to do it. Almost as if it is just not a part of their makeup. Not necessarily calm at all moments, but just unwilling to spend any present moments disasterizing about things in the future over which they have no control. They are very present moment oriented and they have an internal signal that seems to remind them that all worrying must take place now in the present moment and that it is a foolish way to go about living one's current life. With no present moments ever available for awfulizing, they just never seem to get around to the business of worry that so occupies most lives. Your Nez person is able to live now rather than in the past or the future. They are unthreatened by the unknown, and they seek out experiences that are new, untried, and unfamiliar to them. They love ambiguous things rather than being upset by them. They love the now in virtually all settings, being aware that this is all that they have. They don't plan for a future event and let long periods of inactivity elapse as they await a payoff. The moments between events are just as livable as those taken up by the events themselves and they have that uncanny ability to get every pleasure out of their daily lives. They are not postponers saving for a rainy day, and while their culture admonishes such behavior, they are unthreatened by reproachment. They gather in their happiness now, and when a future now arrives, they gather in that one as well. Strange, but this Nez individual is always enjoying simply because they see the folly of waiting to enjoy. This is not some special credo that they've adopted. It is the natural way of living, very much like that of any child or all animals. Grabbing heavy doses of present moment fulfillment while most normals spend their lives waiting for their payoffs and never being able to seize them. These people are strikingly independent people. They are out of the nest. And while they have a strong love and devotion for family, they see independence as far superior to dependence in all relationships.